Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Um, today we'd like to um, talk to Hayden Delaney from Hopgood Denham Lawyers. Um, in this session we'll be discussing IP law. Um, around that, the protection strategies and the key legal risks to address when negotiating IP and ICT contracts. Um, today's webinar is interactive. You'll all see in your screen that you have access to a Q&A uh, button. Please use this throughout. Uh, we may answer your questions as we go, or we'll wait till the end, but it's all about getting your questions answered today. There's also three poll questions that will pop up for about 10 seconds at a time. Um, if we can get your answers around that, it's just to gain a little bit more insight into the audience and, and current and past um, uh, areas around intellectual property. So without further ado, over to you, Hayden. Thanks very much, Ross. Hello, everyone. Can you, can everyone hear me okay? You, you're right hearing me on this end, Ross? Perfect. Excellent. That's great. Look, thanks to everyone um, who has uh, logged in to hear this webinar today. As Ross said, what I really want to cover today is just a, a broad overview, give everyone a little bit of a, a 101 guide on some key intellectual property issues that we often see arising um, for our clients on, on a regular basis as part of their business. And I guess to give an, a bit of an explanation on what IP is generally, um, the different types of IP, the limitations and um, different types of protection offered by the different types of IP. And then to finish um, on a few key issues for, in terms of transactions involving IP, which is really where we get into the commercial aspect of, of intellectual property, how it interacts with our daily business. So you know, I'll, I'll finish on that. So before I sort of drill into any particular type of IP, um, I just wanted to give a bit of an overview on what intellectual property rights are generally, and I guess how they interact with other categories of, of things, which although still an intangible asset, you can't sort of necessarily see or touch it all the time, isn't intellectual property rights in the, in the proper strict sense of the def definition as we use it, um, I guess, as lawyers. So when I'm talking about an intellectual property right, what I'm talking about primarily are categories of legally recognised proprietary rights. They're established by statute. And um, you would have heard some of the types of IP I'm going to rattle out, things like such as copyright, things such as patents, things such as trademarks, registered designs, and plant breeders' rights is another, I guess, more obscure category of intellectual property right. These are all intellectual property rights. And then um, on the other side of the diagram, I've got things, I guess, more broadly classified as information. Sometimes information overlaps with IP and things might be, I guess, fall into both categories, but other times it's not intellectual property right in a proper sense. So things such as confidential information and know-how, things that make us very good at what we do and our skills and, and the types of things we learn as part of our day job, that I guess might be classified as know-how. Confidential information is, I guess, a particular category of information which is not generally known to the public. It's generally a secret um, and in order for I guess a right of confidential information to be enforceable against someone, that person has to owe me an obligation of confidence. Okay, now contrast that with intellectual property rights on, on the left hand side of the screen. These are le legally recognised proprietary rights and they're exercisable against the public at large. They don't have to owe me an obligation of confidence, I don't have to have a contract with them in order for them to be enforceable against, against someone. They're a proper right, a proper proprietary right that I hold. Intellectual property rights can also be dealt with in a more, I guess, commercial manner. So they can be bought, sold or licensed. Generally speaking, you can't sell your know-how or um, makes you good at something because it's not uh, generally understood to be property in the strict legal sense. Now, the other types of, of IP, so you have certain categories of IP which are unregistered. Copyright in Australia is the prime example of that. And then the other categories of IP that I've got on the slide there, patents, trademarks, registered designs, plant breeders' rights. These are all categories of intellectual property rights which need to be registered. So I guess the key takeaway from this slide is understand the difference between what intellectual property is and what might be more broadly classified as information. So things like ideas, confidential information, just raw data could sometimes be subject to an intellectual property right, but it may not. So you need to understand the difference and the limitations. So 
I was then going to jump onto the next slide and talk in, in a little bit more detail about the first specific category of intellectual property right, which is trademarks. So trademarks are a really key aspect of, of IP in terms of people's business. It's the recognised identifier of someone's goods or services, so specific goods or services. If you hold a trademark, you don't hold it for everything in the world. You hold it for specific goods or services which you offer to the public. In terms of how those goods or services are, are set out in Australia, we've got a system of classification and they're classified into 45 different classes of goods or services. And trademarks can be a broad range of things. Some people make the mistake perhaps of sometimes thinking that a trademark might just be a stylized um, form of a word like the Coca-Cola mark that I've got up um, on the side there. It's a very famous trademark, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't necessarily have to be represented in that particular way in order to be a trademark. Penfold's plain word is a registered trademark in Australia. You can have colours, which are registered trademarks in Australia, as that particular colour is. And you can have, um, you know, more sort of, I guess, pure sort of graphical um, graphical devices, such as the um, insurance um, meerkat there, um, compare the market, is there's also a registered trademark in Australia. So a trademark can be a broad range of things. It's anything that you use in your business as a badge of origin to represent your goods or services. Understand that it's only in relation to certain goods or services that you hold trademark rights. And in order to have an enforceable trademark, in order to be able to um, enforce a trademark against someone else by way of a trademark infringement claim, you need to have a registered trademark, okay? Um, trademark rights, generally speaking, need to be registered in order to be enforced against the public. Um, before, I guess, jumping into a little bit more detail, I want to explain a common misconception. Don't confuse trademarks with business names. These things are different. Okay, a trademark is different to a business name. A business name, the reason you might have it is because, uh, say, you have a legal entity, XYZ, PTY, LTD, and you might trade under a different name um, as part of your business to XYZ, PTY, LTD. And the public um, need to know what legal entity sits behind the business. So the law says, well, in order for the public to find out the actual legal entity that sits behind a business, you register a business name. The public can go onto the registry and search it and find out who they're actually dealing with. That's the purpose of the business name. Okay, business names don't give you any exclusive rights over a name. The only thing that will do that is trademark. Okay, so don't confuse business names. Don't think that I have a business name as part of my business and therefore because I do, I have um, an intellectual property right. The reality is you do not. Trademarks are very different to business names. Business names are quite simple to get because they're not, um, they're not an intellectual property right. Trademarks are much more of a process um, to get registered. So before I drill into um, a little bit more detail and uh, I guess a, an explanation of what trademarks are and the, the process to get a trademark, maybe an audience poll, who has previously um, or currently in their business registered or applied to register for a trademark? If we could have a poll um, on that, that would be very helpful. I'll pass to you on that, Ross. Yeah, yeah, we've got a few responses coming through now. Um, look, majority, uh, no, actually, um, about 4% are saying yes, 93% uh, are saying no, 10% are currently in process. Yeah, well, there you go. That's, th those statistics are in line with my understanding that um, often people, when they start up a business, they might go and uh, register a company, they might go and register a business name. Perhaps a lot of the time, uh, getting trademark protection can be an afterthought. And then um, often when it... Um, comes to, I guess, the real issue, people might go to and seek legal advice and say someone else is using a name or an identifier or, or a logo that's similar to mine and people are getting confused. They think they're dealing with me when they're not. It's at that point in time that we need to have a difficult discussion that, you know, you need to have a registered trademark generally to have exclusive rights over that particular. Yeah. Okay. okay. We've got a we've got a question here, if you don't mind. Um, I'm a founder of a startup company and, and an international student in Australia. Can I register my design ideas in Australia? This is from Mike. Yeah. Look, that's that's a really good question. Um, I suppose it depends on the category of what you're creating. Yeah. Um, if you're by the sounds of it, it sounds like you it might be some sort of um 
creative artistic work like um, drawings for um, industrial purposes or maybe they're just um, uh, you know designs used um, for some form of artistic purpose um, but look the types of IP that might be relevant to that and I'll talk in the context of copyright in a moment but just to answer the question you, you may have copyright um, in the designs yeah. if you've created them um, and you haven't otherwise um, assigned them to someone else for example if you've created them in the course of um, your employment for someone else yeah. Assuming you've just created them in your own right as part of your own business, you'll automatically have um, copyright in them potentially, um, in which case you don't necessarily need to register that. You will have copyright subsisting. If um, what we're talking about is an article which might eventually be manufactured on an industrial scale or something like that, registered designs become relevant, um, which is another different type of IP. Oh, so okay. look. So the drawing itself and having protection in a drawing itself, it will have copyright in it. If you want to stop people from, say, reverse engineering a physical product, that's an industrial product or an, a, an article that's going to be manufactured on a significant scale, in order to stop that type of conduct, you would need to get a registered design. And is that also for, like, automation systems and in that sort of space? Um, look, automation... And systems and, and perhaps methods and, and or um, inventions that sort of automate a process but perhaps more fall into the category of a patent right, which is different again. So just to sort of explain to a higher level the difference, we've got trademarks, which we've talked about. Copyright protects the expression of ideas in material form by creators. So a drawing, software, something for that category. A registered design protects the visual look or appearance of an article that's manufactured on a commercial scale. Yeah. And then you have patent protect maybe the method or the invention itself or the discovery. Yeah. Um, and of those, uh, those categories I've mentioned, all of them have to be registered except for copyright, which exists automatically. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. No problem. So just jumping back into trademarks, um, as I said, trademarks are a process, okay? It's not like a, a business name where you just get it quickly, okay? Sometimes getting a registered trademark can take up to 21 months, but the key thing is when you apply. The date you apply for a trademark is your priority date, and the importance of that is that any, um, I guess, third party to subsequently use um, a name or a logo that is um, similar or identical to yours, after that priority date, in relation to the same or similar services as your business, your priority date will, as the name implies, take priority over their usage for their yeah. The priority date, the date you apply is key. Yes, it might take a while to get it registered, but once you do get it registered, your rights are backdated to the date you apply. Okay, so it's the application date that is key and critical. Okay, yeah. Now, there's two key requirements um, to be considered during trademark examination. I'm just going to really touch on these briefly. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but absolute grounds or otherwise known as distinctiveness or inherent adaptability to distinguish. A trademark can't merely just describe the goods or services you provide. I can't. I, I would really struggle to go and get a trademark for good lawyers or something like that because it's descriptive of the services that I as a lawyer provide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Whatever you do, if it's refreshing soft drink and you sell soft drinks, getting a trademark for refreshing soft drink will be a problem. It's merely descriptive, okay? Yeah. So a trademark has to be distinctive of the goods or services you're providing. It can't just be generic or describe the service. Yeah. The second issue um, is, a, is called, I guess, relative grounds um, or a section 44 ground, which basically means it can't be substantially identical or deceptively similar to um, a prior a prior trademark application or a prior trademark registration in the same or similar as the goods or services. So that ground, you really need to do some searching to see whether or not it's going to cause a problem for you and your business. Yeah. Um, we've touched on the fact that trademarks are a registered right, okay? Um, don't go and threaten someone to sue them with, with a trademark infringement action until you actually have registered rights. Um, doing it before you have registered rights could result um, in a groundless threats claim being brought against you. The other crap just to think about with trademarks is jurisdiction specific, okay? You don't have a trademark on a worldwide basis. There's no such thing as a worldwide trademark. Trademarks are jurisdiction specific, okay? In the categories in which um, those jurisdictions work, your countries are divided into two. You're either a first to file jurisdiction or a first to use. In other words, um, 
understanding the owner of a trademark will be dictated by two different methods. One is the is person is first to file a trademark application. Other jurisdictions like Australia is the first person to use to use the trademark in respect of certain goods or services. Okay. okay. Another trap with trademarks. I mean, if some people make the mistake of thinking trademarks are really simple, but there are just a whole bucket load of traps you can fall into. So sometimes people might register um, the trademark in their own name, maybe as a shareholder, um, yet the entity that um, uses the trademark might be a company, right? You might be a shareholder or the majority shareholder in that company. If you've done that, later down the track, you could open yourself up to a non-use um, action. The reason you have to use the trademark in order for it to be valid. And if the entity that's using the trademark is someone other than the recorded legal owner, then that potential ground to validate that trademark. So, and it can be really costly later down the track um, trying to sort that out. So getting it right at the outset is imperative. Yeah, yeah, okay. So as I said before, use it or lose it, trademarks become vulnerable um, to removal for non-use once certain um, time periods are elapsed. The most common one is if it's been registered for five years or more and you can't show that three years before a non-use claim has been brought that you've used it in relation to um, the relevant goods or services, it can be revoked on the basis of non-use. Yeah. That's trademarks. Um, I was going to jump into copyright now, which is particularly a relevant intellectual property right for the ICT industry. I don't know if we've got any other questions on trademarks, Ross, but if I might just jump straight into copyright. Um, just one uh, is, do they need to be unique as in the trademark and, and what kind of defines that? Yeah, they don't have to be unique as in um, never been done, been done before. It's not sort of so binary as that. Yeah. Um, trademarks have to be, um, they can't, as I said, in that relative grounds risk before, they can't be substantially identical or deceptively similar yeah. to another trademark in relation to the same or similar goods or services. So in other words, you, know, you might have Hopgood Genom um, as a trademark in relation to legal services, yeah. and um, we do have that registered for a variety of services, including legal services, but if someone applied for it you know, in relation to um, delicate ham, yeah. um, then it's going to be, you know, that is not the, what trademarks are designed to protect. They stop it in relation to specific services. Okay, yeah. so you can, have a, you can have identical trademarks. They yeah. don't have to be, but they, they could um, be identical, but they're in completely different um, goods or services. Okay, and and I suppose to just just one from Tony that supports that is, what's the easiest way um, we can identify a trademarks not assigned? Um, sorry, what was that, Ross? Just repeat that question. Sorry, uh, what's the easiest way we can identify a, a trademarks not assigned? Not assigned. Yeah, or, or not taken. Oh, okay, so not not registered or something yeah. like that. Well, you, yeah. okay, you yeah. can certainly get legal advice, and that that can help. But if you want to just do some preliminary searching yourself, and I understand why people want to do that, um, you can go on in Australia to IP Australia's website, and they have a, a database which you can search for prior registered rights, and that might give you a little bit of an indication as to whether there's going to be a major red flag or not. And if there's things that you're not sure about, um, I guess the message to take away is it can be a bit tricky sometimes. You might want to seek legal advice. It's not particularly expensive to do so um, yeah. if, if you have any questions. Okay, great. Thanks. No worries, Ross. Okay, throwing on to copyright. So copyright's another different category of intellectual property, right? Okay, we've been through trademarks. We understand what that protects. Copyright, as I said before, it's an unregistered right. You don't need to go and register it in Australia. And it's this automatically on creation when you have an idea and you reduce it to a material form. You reduce that idea to a material form. So, for example, you, you put it down pen to paper or you type it on a document, you're creating source code and software, um, you're um, doing the storyboard for a UX design or something mm -hmm. like that. All of these things are you've had an idea and you've reduced it to a material form. Copyright subsists in it at that point. Okay. In order for you to have copyright protection, it has to be what's called original, but there's a lot of confusion with what means original in the context of copyright. Really all it means is that some human person has applied some skill, labour or judgement in terms of 
the creation of that work. So, I mean, a really famous case, which I'll talk to in a, in a couple of slides time, was um, a television um, guide case. So here I've got um, television guide up on the slides. Yeah. Um, in, in that um, case before the courts, the, the issue was is that, um, look, that guide, if a human um, had some role of creating it, it, would, it will have copyright in it. But the issue um, in this particular um, court case was that it was created purely by software. No human was involved, okay? And on that basis, they couldn't meet the originality threshold. So look, be aware of originality and what it requires, but it's not a high threshold um, to, to get to. You don't have to be super like unique or inventive or anything like that. You just have had have to apply some skill labor or judgment and that's it. Yeah. You'll have copyright. Yeah. The biggest issue with copyright isn't subsistence, it's ownership, okay? Figuring out who actually owns copyright um, can often be a problem. You know, the default rule under the Copyright Act generally is that the author or creator of the work is the owner, okay? There are a couple of exemptions to that. The most important one is the employment exemption. So if you are an employee mm. and you're a proper employee and you um, do things in the course of your employment for your employer, um, then by virtue of the Copyright Act, those things done in the course of that employment, those things created which give rise to copyright, will be owned by the employer. Okay. Now, where confusion often arises is where people engage not as an employee but a contractor or, you know, a consultant or something more informal. Yeah. That's actually a real problem um, a lot of the time for businesses and clients, in my experience, because often what will happen is a client will sort of come to me and they might say, oh, I've paid this developer a million dollars to create this particular software and, um, you know, I'm having a bust up with them about some way, shape or form. Usually um, in that fight, what will happen is maybe the developer might use as leverage the fact that um, they're the creator of that software, right? Yeah. And despite the fact that they've been paid to create it, under the Copyright Act, they will be the owner of the copyright and the person who's paid a million dollars will have a license. Unless in the contract itself there has been a written assignment of the copyright, okay? It has to be in writing, it has to be signed by both parties for it to be effective. Otherwise, the creator is the owner and it doesn't matter whether you pay a million a trillion dollars yeah. in creative. So it's really important not to, if you're thinking about engaging someone to create something for you and they're not an employee, to make sure that you have that paperwork, the um, services agreement or intellectual property assignment agreement, whatever it might be, yeah. that has to have the right assignment in there. Otherwise, you're going to get big problems down the line. Yeah. yeah. That's a, a simple lesson, but an important one. Yeah. Now, up on the screen, the other thing I've got there is moral rights. I'm not going to talk in great detail about them, just be aware of them. They're a related right to copyright. These are rights that can't be bought or sold. You can't sell your moral rights, the rights that attach to the creator of a work. And even if someone um, else has bought the copyright from that creator, um, they, the author will still have moral rights to be attrib attributed as author of the work or a right not to be falsely attributed as an author. You know, if you're a famous um, artist, you don't want to be said that this really bad, terrible painting is your work, so you've got that right as well too. Um, and a right of integrity of authorship, so not to have your work interfered with and messed up in a way that sort of makes it um, look bad or something like that. So those are rights that can't be bought and sold. Uh, a creator or author has them. You can agree to have them waived though. So often in employment agreements and contracting agreements and like, you'll see a clause which waives or consents to an infringement of your moral right. Yeah. All right, um, and I, an important thing to understand with copyright, as I've touched on, it protects the expression of an idea, not an idea itself. So if, if I have an idea um, to write a book about a boy who um, is born as a wizard and um, it's this coming of age sort of story where he makes friends with other wizards. It sounds like Harry Potter, but provided I haven't copied any sentences or anything like that out of J.K. Rowling's famous book, I won't have infringed copyright because copyright subsists in the expression of an idea, not the idea itself. Yeah. Okay, again, copyright in HTML on the screen there, if that's been created by a human author, copyright will subsist in that. We've looked at um, the television guide. Okay. We've already touched on a bit of this, so I won't sort of go through it. Um, but I will touch on the second bullet point on the slide there, just to sort of consider when you're engaging people or working collaboratively with people, um, as we often do in um, real commercial life. 
it's important to consider um, at the outset of every transaction, I guess, what IP each party might be bringing to the table for a particular project, which both have already created and they might say, all right, I'm a developer, I've got all this background pre-existing IP, I'm going to use it to make um, your particular um, dev project quicker, speed it up so you don't have to pay heaps of money. That's actually technically background IP of theirs, they haven't created it for you or in the course of performing services for you. So you've got to think about how background IP is going to be dealt with, whether you're a developer or whether you're a customer. Is it going to be retained by the person who created it initially, or is it going to be transferred across? These things need to be adequately contemplated and dealt with in the contract, otherwise it's going to be a whole lot of confusion down the line. Often an example I might see is someone's engaged a developer, right? Um, and the developer has just, rather than reinvented the wheel, used a lot of their background IP, um, and the customer, you know, was diligent and got a copyright assignment for new IP created in the course of the engagement. But 98% of the source code, for instance, is all background IP. So the, the end amount that they own is very tiny, it's a small sliver. Yet, from the customer's perspective, they think, I paid for this product, I negotiated the provision in the contract, I must own it. And all, likewise, from the developer's perspective, you know, the shoe's on the other foot and I'm acting for the developer, mm. um, they're contributed all this valuable asset to speed things up and make it quicker for that customer, um, you know, should they be giving away all of that um, background IP, you know, arguably they shouldn't, um, might be important not to do so. The important thing is the parties need to understand this and have it properly documented in a contract. Yeah, okay. So, just some common issues of where copyright issues might ar arise, branding, logo designs, people often outsource their logo 99 designs or something like that. And then when um, you know people are doing due diligence on the business and they want to see whether all the key copyright works are owned, um, they realise, oh gee, I never got a copyright assignment for that particular thing and it pulls the pay wire out for, you know, a whole lot of chaos when the transaction is happening. So yeah. you just need to think about that. Product designs, business plans and reports, software code, People, when they get like work experience or interns or something like that, they're not technically employees. So what they create, you won't have the benefit of that particular rule of the Copyright Act, which means you need to deal with it. Oh, okay. No, I think um, a few points there to digest in, in copyright. Um, maybe another um, audience poll, who ensures when they're engaging someone to create something, and don't think about employees, think about sort of contractors and consultants and all. Yeah. Who ensures written copyright assignments in their contracts. I'll throw a little bit yep, that. That's up and we're getting some responses now. Oh, this is a bit different. Um, while we're waiting, I've just got a question. Here's a, actually a good one from Cole. If a programmer looks right. at a code to work out um, to how to do something, then goes and reproduces the same methodology with their own code, is that a copyright breach? Okay, that's a really good question, Ross. So say um, we've got um, a basic idea. Say it's um, a fundamental algorithm for determining the velocity of an object. And, you know, we, we all know, some of us might know um, some of the basic sort of equations for determining how you calculate velocity. And if you then take that idea, being um, the actual um, equation for determining velocity and express it in a material form in software, yeah. um, then then um, you will not infringe someone else's copyright by, by doing that because all you take replicated is an idea. Okay? Mm. The problems arise when you take someone else's software, yeah. which is already implementing the idea, okay. and put it in your own software. Okay, Now, maybe you've got a license to do that or it's open source. And that's a different issue which I'll discuss later, but yeah. that's when alarm bells need to be ringing. Not so much when someone said, hey, I've got an idea for creating something, can you create it? And you go and create it, you reduce that idea into a material form. Yeah. That's not a copyright work, that's just copying an idea. Yeah. Issues arise when you actually copy, copy part of it, it doesn't have to be a big part, and put it in your own work, be yeah. it software or um, you know, wireframes for a design, whatever it might be. Yeah. So just back to the poll. So 26% said um, yes, they do. 26% said no, and 51% said sometimes. Yeah. So look, 
that is a really key issue for businesses. If you aren't getting a copyright assignment from your contractors or consultants, um, you're, you don't technically own what they create. So there's a big percentage of people out there um, that are doing it the wrong way. Um, and if they ever go to sell their business or their company, um, when lawyers do due diligence on that, they're going to encounter problems. And it could throw the whole business or, or share sale transaction out um, because you actually don't own what you think you own. So it's such a critical thing to get right for business. Yeah, thanks. So key takeaway points, okay? Copyright is a bundle of rights um, in relation to a particular work. Okay, a work could be a literary work, an artistic work, cinematographic work, all those sorts of things. And a work is, is an idea reproduced in material form. Okay, and it's really important that you ensure you identify and understand who owns the copyright in the works. Mm. Two really take away. All right, um, I'm going to move away from IP. Now, I should just add that because we're limited in time, I'm not going to address all the different types of IP today. So the other key types of IP are, of course, patents and registered designs. I've talked a little bit about them at the start of this webinar, I just touched on it. The reason I'm not going to address it in detail is because I could spend an entire webinar on, on particularly patents. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's a lot to cover, so I'm not going to cover it all, but just be aware of it, okay? That there are the key types of IP, registered designs and patents. They protect different things, you know, where I said the limitation of copyright is it doesn't protect ideas. Yeah. Patents sometimes can if it's patentable subject matter. So to get a patent, okay, it has to be patentable subject matter, which are certain things that the law says you can or can't have a patent over. Um, and it covers things like inventions, discoveries, and methods which are novel and they've not been done before. Yeah. Okay, that's what, and it's a registered form of IP. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but you do need to be aware of it. So if there's no other questions on that, I'm going to jump over to IP in transactions. Um, oh, this actually, this is a good one. Um, if, any, if an idea is copyrighted to an individual, but they decide to sell it later, do they still own the same copy or hold the same copyright for that idea? Okay. So there's a couple of things there. You don't hold copyright for an idea, remember. You hold copyright for an expression of an idea. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first. But um, assume you do own copyright to a particular expression of an idea, sell it to someone, or you sign it in front of that person, mm. then you don't own it anymore. And to use it again, unless you have a license from the new owner, to do so would be an infringement of copyright. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, and that's probably a good segue into IP transactions, um, yeah. licenses. So the key types of um, transactions relevant to IP are assignments. So when I assign my IP, I've legally transferred it from someone to another person. And once I've assigned it, I don't own it anymore. I have no rights of ownership to it anymore. Someone else owns it, just like if I own a house and I've sold it to someone else, yeah. the new owner, not the owner, doesn't, you know, I can't go in and just live in that house anymore. I've sold it. Same with IP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, the other key type of transaction is a license. Okay. So I might own IP and I don't want to um, sell it to someone else. I just want to grant them limited rights to do something with it. Okay. So I still retain ownership, but I grant someone a license to my IP. For instance, I grant you a license to um, take the, the binary of this particular software and install it on a specific device. Mm. Or uh, I grant you a license to um, use the name Hopgood Genom Lawyers to operate a legal practice in X jurisdiction, okay? It, it's, I still retain ownership, but I'm granting rights to someone else to do something with it. It's kind of, a, if you use a real property, you know, analogy, it's kind of more like a lease, okay? But it, it is still a bit different. Yeah. The other areas where IP is relevant, of course, are in, you know, when you're going to buy or sell a business or an M&A transaction is taking place. So I've already um, spoken at just then about the difference between licensing and assigning, assign, and an assignment rather, okay? They're on the slide there too. But when you're talking about licensing IP, because you're still retaining certain rights and granting rights to someone else, what's key is the scope of the license. That's what's really crucial. So on the slide here, I've got a basic licensing model. So the licensor is the owner of the intellectual property rights. Okay? They're gonna grant a subset of rights to the licensee. So maybe it's the copyright in software. 
Um, so they grant, for example, on a the slide there, a uh, license to the licensee to use certain software at a particular site for 50 um, named users. Um, you could also limit it maybe by specific devices or within a specific geographic region. That's a basic licensing model on the screen. Now, drilling down on licensing models a little bit more, um, I've got three common different models of licensing IP on the slide now. The first is an exclusive license. When I grant an exclusive license to someone, um, it means I'm granting um, a right to, uh, to that IP to the exclusion of all others during the term of that license, even myself. If I'm the owner of IP and I've granted someone an exclusive license to it in Australia, I can't use that IP in Australia. Only the exclusive licensee can. Okay, so it's a, it's a special category of license. It's generally speaking the most commercially valuable type of license. Yeah. Second of all, we've got a sole license. Now, a sole license is a bit of a spin on um, the exclusive license. It's a grant of rights to exclusion of all others except the licensor. So the licensor can still exercise those rights and the licensee can exercise those rights. No one else can. And then finally, you've got the non-exclusive right, um, license. So a grant of rights with no limit on those rights being granted again to others. Okay, so you can limit it, grant it an unlimited amount of time to the period. Now, the exclusive license is a special category of license again, because it's the only category where um, the exclusive licensee can also sue a third party for uh, intellectual property infringement. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. So if you're granted an exclusive license and it meets the formality requirements of an exclusive license within the Copyright Act or Patent Act, whatever it might be, you can sue someone else for, for intellectual property infringement, as can the owner. Yeah. Okay. If you're the licensee of any of these other types, sole or non-exclusive, you cannot bring infringement proceedings. That, um, in a nutshell, is the basic types of granting a license and how it tends to work. If there's no questions on that, I'm going to just talk about generally identifying and stock-taking stock IP assets. So in other words, if you um, are a startup or you have an established business, it is very smart practice from time to time just to get an understanding of what IP subsists within your business. Um, you need to know what you have, what um, IP you're using in, part in your business, because maybe um, you're using IP which you think you own, but you actually don't. You mm. might have a license. It. Okay, so um, you may not actually have rights to use it in a particular way and um, that can cause problems because you might get sued for IP infringement because of that. On top of that, uh, maybe a particular transaction requires it, so you might be looking to buy, or sell, to buy or sell a business. If you're looking to sell a business or shares in a company, um, the purchaser or potential purchaser will do due diligence, which means they'll, they'll get lawyers involved and they'll drag everything over hot coals and figure out exactly where all the problems are. Um, and they'll say, might come back and say, oh, all this stuff which you're, you think you're selling to me, you actually don't own. So instead of paying you $3 million, I'm going to pay you $50,000. Okay, so getting this right um, can have big rewards and also big consequences to get it wrong commercially. So the other reason is you might be working in a collaborative environment with someone. So maybe um, you're going to go into some sort of joint arrangement with um, you know, a super high-tech organisation, say CSIRO. Yeah. CSIRO, um, you're going to engage um, with them and CSIRO might have all this pre-existing background IP which is very valuable. And you might have some background IP which is very valuable as well. And you're both going to contribute that background IP and do certain things with it and create new IP. Yeah. Dealing with who owns each category of background IP and how each party can use it is so critical and important. It's very complicated um, to sort of draft in a contract and do it properly, but you need to do it. Otherwise, problems are going to arise. And um, you know, understanding how new IP, um, who owns that, will also be a key issue. Maybe one party owns it and the other gets a license. Maybe they jointly own it. Um, and if they do jointly own it, how can each joint owner use it? Can each just go off and do their own thing, or do they need the permission of the other? Mm. These are all things you thought about. The other reason why it's a good idea, registered IP like uh, patents or trademarks or registered designs, um, they have key deadlines associated with them. So you might be have a pending patent application, 
there's so many deadlines that are associated with that. So, and if you miss them, it's super unforgiving. You might lose um, your rights to get a patent permanently because maybe you know you were, you know, you had a meeting one day or something like that, and you were busy. We all get busy, and you missed a deadline. Those deadlines are unforgiving. You cannot miss them. So you've got to make sure you're on top of them. And you've got to have a system to make sure that you're aware of them coming up and what needs to be done. Or you know, you can use a legal professional to deal with that and take that pain off you. Mm. Um, but either way, you have to be aware of those deadlines. Finally, it's just good business practice to do these things. You need to stock take what your business does in an intellectual property sense to determine the value of the assets it has, um, what it can sell, what it can't sell, um, all that sort of stuff. It's just smart business practice. Yeah. Um, the other thing to think about as part of a IP stock take, I guess, is third party license terms and it's particularly relevant to the ICT industry. So we don't like reinventing the wheel, I understand that. Um, and you know, sometimes when you're looking to build a castle, Lego castle I've got on the slide on the screen there, um, to put it in simple terms, sometimes when you're looking to build a castle, maybe you don't need to reinvent a drawbridge. Maybe someone's already got pre-existing drawbridges. So you've built this castle, but the only thing you don't have is the drawbridge. You could go and build it yourself, but you know, you can save heaps of money by going off to someone else and using their drawbridge. Okay, so you might use a third-party drawbridge. The rest is all yours. Yeah. Well. Um, in an intellectual property sense, the same sort of thing happens, right? So you might develop um, a piece of software and maybe for certain things, um, you don't need to write it again from scratch. You might go and get it from an open source um, license or, or you might license it um, on a proprietary basis from a third party just to save time and cost and, you know, if something's been tried or tested, why reinvent that wheel? Yeah. Excuse me. So I can understand all of that, but that being said, when you um, put third party IP and mix it together with proprietary IP, which is owned by your business, what's actually happening is agreeing to a license from a third party license or and sometimes the terms of that license might actually be a real problem for your business. Maybe they say that um, you can't do certain things. So maybe it's, um, you know, yes, I'll grant you a license to use this, but you can't use it for commercial purposes. Yet if you're using this software, for commercial purposes, the whole point is, um, you know, commercial is, com is the commercial aspect of it. So then to agree to a license like that and then put it in a product which you're dealing with commercially, you're actually breaching the license and you're potentially infringing someone's copyright. Mm. That's a problem. On top of that, um, some third party um, license terms or open source license terms like GNU and that sort of thing can contain terms which um, require you to share alike. So in other words, as an uh, open source license, or I grant you a license to use my software, you can embody it within your product. Um, but when you distribute that product, um, which might be commercially valuable to you to third parties, you have to license your product on the same GNU terms, which um, is a free open source license. So if you're looking to charge a license fee or make some money off your software, don't go and put um, a term like that in, in your software because you are agreeing to have to share your entire source code with the public for free on GNU terms, which is a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, again, that's something where me as a lawyer, when someone says, um, I want to buy this um, IP from someone else, you know, we will drag that software over hot coals and find every problem we possibly can and find out whether someone's been using open source in a, in a poor way or not using best practice will find what the terms are and you'll use that as leverage to try and reduce price sometimes. Mm -hmm. So another audience poll who, when I guess they're developing things, you might be a software developer or maybe you're a UX designer or maybe um, you're a solutions architect, okay, whatever it is. Who uses third-party content sometimes when um, they're doing their day-to-day -day day job? Um, and who actually reads the license terms attaching to that when they mix it with your own sort of original content? Yeah, okay. So we've got some responses coming through now. I'll just, um, just go back to a question that we had prior. Does copyright protect an architecture? Yes. Copyright protects um, architectural plans, okay, so the drawings, and it also there are special provisions um, that attach to the actual um, physical um, embodiment of that mm. work in, in, in um, uh, like a, 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 an architectural building or something like that. Yeah. So yes, copyright does protect architectural.
architectural plans. In fact, architectural plans are a very commonly disputed to um, that, that we see a lot of the time because people, when they engage in architect, it's just common not to sort of think about IP in the detail they probably should, given you're going to spend a lot of money. So yeah. um, it is something to think about. Okay. So we've got the poll through now. Um, 38% said yes. Uh, 14% said no, and 49% said sometimes. Yeah. There's still sometimes. So, yeah. yeah, so that's right. Look, it's, it's by the sounds of it, a bit of a mixed reaction from the audience. Some people are diligent by the sounds of it. I'd be interested to know whether the people that, you know, even do do it, whether they keep track of it. So if I said to you, a year from now, give me all a list of all the open source products or third party licensed products that are in this particular um, work you've created. Give me a list of it all and where it is and what the terms are. Pro people probably couldn't yet. That's something that lawyers will ask for during due diligence in an MA process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, look, um, that is. I guess, a, a short introduction on IP. There is a lot more detail to it. By no means um, is this all you need to know, but I hope that what we've discussed today will be of some benefit, at least get people thinking about things that maybe they haven't thought of before. And, and um, hopefully um, you know, people will go away and sort of um, apply some, some of the things they've learned in their business or their day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. And if there's any other questions now, I think we've got some time, Ross, so right. by all means people can yeah, look, I've had someone come through, Cole, uh, in regards to is a licence something that only a legal profession, professional sorry, can draw up? Um, look, I, I'm, uh, it will be self-serving for me to say yes, but look, to be honest, yes. Um, yeah. Just because um, they're complicated documents and yeah. uh, getting it right can be so important sometimes. So for the sake of, you know, spending a little bit i just think if it's if whatever it relates to is commercially valuable you know maybe if it's you know, if what you're talking about is only worth 500 dollars, then maybe you know you wouldn't but if it's going to be commercially valued now or down the line yeah. you know a few years from now you'd be mad not to because yeah there are so many encounters yeah, and it's it's one of the, what I've noticed is there's um, IT and, and technology. There's a lot of grey areas, and um, I think you've highlighted a few challenges that can come up if you don't do the due diligence and you don't go to the detail that's required for this. Because it's not as a matter of printing something off the internet and signing it, because there's so much to it that's on an individual yep. case basis. Yep. Exactly right. So yes, you might see a template online, but how do you know that template um, is suitable for your business? What you do is different to everyone else's. So those templates are provided on the assumption people actually read them and are, are I guess, comfortable um, mm. technically knowing what needs to be changed, what the key issues are, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, there's no one size fits all when it comes to things. Everyone's, um, mm. you know, decision and what they're going to do with their business is, is different. Uh, so to treat it like a one size fits all is again a common mistake. So you need to think about what you actually need to achieve commercially and is that aptly dealt with in the document? And I'd hazard a guess that it probably isn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, you've highlighted the, the seriousness of it. And um, it's something I suppose people need to look at initially in a business as part of setting it up. And if, in, especially in this tech space in these day and age. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely yeah. right. Look, Hayden, thank you so much for your time. I've had a few people um, thank you for, for the content today. Um, I would really encourage any of the audience, if they've got their personal uh, questions and situations they want to look at IP, Hayden's got his um, contact details up on the screen. Please contact him direct. Um, also, if you've got anything, any questions regarding the webinar, um, please send them to acsqldevents at acs.org.au. Thanks so much for your time, Hayden. We really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again. Thanks very much for having me, Ross, and thanks to all the members who dialed in. No worries. Take care. Bye-bye.